Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be here. I do feel as though I'm um, somewhat in judgment tonight in this building, but I will do my best, and particularly as I only have 15 minutes and quite a lot of ground to cover. Um, thank you, Jerry, for a lovely introduction. Um, Vinya has, uh, uh, has produced a really good context for what I want to talk about. I want to focus a little more on the UK and then finish up talking about intangible values in Liverpool. What I'm, not, what, I'm not going, what I'm not going to do is spend a lot of time talking about outstanding universal value, you'll be glad to hear, other than to say that um, the language has always been difficult to understand. It's a particular language that comes from UNESCO and it's a particularly difficult concept to put into layman's terms. Nor am I going to say a great deal about boundaries other than, other than to confess that it was me who drew the red line here in Liverpool originally, so you could say it's all my fault, but um, please, Your Honour, uh, uh, my defence will follow. Um, and nor am I going to go back through again the full range of tangible, intangible uh, values, other than to say that Liverpool is an evolving townscape and those intangible values are just as significant as the tangible ones that we all know and love. Before I do that, though, I just want to quickly remind you that Liverpool is part of a very exclusive club of 31 World Heritage Sites in the UK, and there are, there are various different kinds. There's the monocentric ones, there's the prehistory ones, there's geological places, uh, and there are cultural landscapes, all of which, by the way, are becoming more and more complex as time's gone on. So the early ones were very simple. The later ones are quite complicated. Um, and of course, um, of great interest tonight are the ones um, that are the whole city sites or whole city center sites. And those urban places, as Minja has said to us, are extremely complex. They also are the ones that have the most complex and tangible values underlying the obvious. They're also the ones that have large buffer zones, as you have in Liverpool here, um, which takes in a very large part of the city centre. I prefer to think of them as zones of influence, actually, rather than zones of protection. And on top of that, as we've had pointed out to us already, the agenda now is about sustainable cities and how we blend conservation uh, and development. That is the primary issue. Before we leave the UK level, um, as you can see, there are 31 sites, uh, or 27 onshore sites, I should say, and actually it's the collection of those, as well as the individuals, that makes this so important, at least for the UK in many respects, not least of which is tourism. So if we take a look um, in a little more detail at the top level here, what we find is that the culture white paper from government um, boasts a lot about how it's going to have a global strategy which is um, promoting the high standards of World Heritage Site Management, which they haven't yet got around to doing, and support has been quite minimal uh, in recent years. The early work in the 2007 time about what the benefits of World Heritage Site would be was mostly tied up with various local authorities deciding whether it would be worth the money on the nomination or not, and was very cost-benefit analysis led. So not hugely helpful today. Um, but nevertheless, at the national level, there are figures like 85 million pounds being talked about as what World Heritage Sites in the UK attract by way of investment. Um, and we also know, for example, that heritage in general uh, brings to the economy something like 16 billion pounds uh, annually. We also know that some of our most visited sites, those that have two to five million visitors a year, Tower of London, Stonehenge and so on, four, four out of the five most visited sites are World Heritage sites. They're icons, but actually um, there is a large number of World Heritage sites uh, which are not iconic at the moment and are actually quite well concealed and people are very unaware of them. So this business of unawareness and being able to raise the profile of the presence of World Heritage Sites as well as raising the awareness and trying to explain what outstanding universal value is about is absolutely critical. 
And it isn't just about money, there are other benefits. So um, the cultural facilities that tend to follow World Heritage Sites, new museums, uh, new art programs and so on, are hugely important. The social cohesion that often happens within a World Heritage Site for communities, feeling like they can get behind something that's common to everybody uh, is hugely important. The um, civic pride that's been referred to, people, people are very proud of their place. And Liverpool is actually a terrific case in point. Everybody I meet in Liverpool, and I've been coming here for quite a long time now, is hugely proud of this city. Whatever else it may be to other people, it's their city. And even though now today, health and well-being, so everybody talks about this kind of thing, but um, health and well-being is often about how good you feel about what you do. So a lot of volunteering happens in World Heritage Sites. People feel really good about that. They give passion, they give time. And in our World Heritage Sites, our local coordinators and managers, as I've said in other places, are the heroines and heroes of this piece. They work very hard indeed to outreach to you, the community, and to uh, education institutions and other places. Very much un unsung um, and very much working with passion and uh, free time uh, in enormous ways. Okay. Um, I think it's worth saying too that I've had the benefit and privilege over the last six months of reviewing all of our onshore world heritage sites on behalf of WHUK. And what was revealed was enormous variation in scale, complexity, governance, funding, uh, uh, and political will, etc. I hadn't realized before I had the opportunity to do this just how complex it was. And each and every one of them has its own set of problems. Liverpool is not alone uh, here in this, in this quite controversial time. But most importantly, there is a very low uh, uh, awareness of values. Um, but just returning to the pound sign for a moment, you can see on the screen there uh, uh, some numbers which actually represent what evidence there is available at the moment, and there is very little evidence available, relatively speaking, it certainly isn't consistent across the board, of um, the sorts of things that World Heritage Sites can do. So in Corn the Cornish mining one has attracted £100 million worth of investment over the last 10 years. Little Blind Avon's done £50 million. Or if you do it the other way around and look locally at what's happening uh, by way of contribution to the local economy in terms of uh, uh, money into the economy based directly on the World Heritage Site, as you can see, it goes from half a million, or should I say 100 million, Jurassic Coast, uh, to 6 million in, in New Lanark. So um, the other benefits, the non-money ones, depend on um, the efforts of those coordinators, depend on political financial support, and more than anything else, depend on a championing politically. And uh, those that have had that benefit um, have thrived. Those that have not, have not thrived so well. So I just wanted to quickly tell you the Blind Avon story. Blind Avon, of course, is tiny compared to Liverpool, but nevertheless, it was a derelict kind of a place after the coal industry left in South Wales. Um, it was made a World Heritage Site in 2000, uh, but right from the start, the politicians, the planners, and everybody else put World Heritage values at the center of what they were going to do in terms of regeneration. And it's been enormously successful with the transformation over the last 10 or 15 years, the 50 million I spoke about, the creation of a destination for tourism, phase one, so to speak, and the presentation all the time of the intangible values that came from the mining community, not many people left uh, who were the actual co-miners, the lifestyle and, and the culture and arts that go with that. Quite small in extent, but the point I'm making is the narrative was there from the start and underlaid the obvious physical fabric, which was the World Heritage Site. They also got business to, businesses to engage in the World Heritage Site. And the one that I think is best of all is that they encouraged children of the age of 10 and 12, um, 10 years ago, to become the champions of the World Heritage Site. What you saw was these young guys getting really excited about being part of the club that included the Taj Mahal, Tower of London, and Blind Avenue. Those guys are 10 years old are now 21 years old 
and they are the guys who are the ambassadors that make this thing continue to work. So this is a microcosmic version, really, but it's not impossible, and it wouldn't be impossible in Liverpool. Okay, so um, let's, let's turn to Liverpool for a moment. Um, I was here in 2004, in fact, before 2004, helping to prepare the nomination document and the management plan, and I was well aware that running alongside that was the European City of Culture preparation, led by Liverpool Vision and one or two other agencies. It was a great time, there was regional agency money flowing everywhere. But I have to say, uh, those um, ambitions for City of Culture, believe it or not, did overshadow the World Heritage Site and indeed its success even in 2004. So it is arguable that there has been a bit of a vacuum in terms of World Heritage Site ever since that time. However, um, the assets and the improvement of those physical assets um, was achieved in no uncertain way, as was the development of tourism. There remains a poor understanding of the benefits of World Heritage Sites here, um, but it's not something that can't be solved. So I'm not going to read that out. Oh, oops. I'm not going to read that quote. I'll let you do that while I speak. The, the point that I want to point out for you is it says people right in the middle there. Tangible assets or tangible values are completely worthless without the intangibles underlying them. The potential is here in Liverpool. It is yet unrealised. Okay, so very quickly then, let, well, what actually are those intangible values and, and how can we get to grips with this? Well, as someone already said, it's quite difficult, but underlying the World Heritage Site here and very much part of the outstanding universal value is that sense of innovation that happened all those years ago. The guys who built the port were determined to stay ahead by being ahead of everybody else, so they innovated in the way that you're uh, aware of. The legacy of that is still here on the ground, and the vacant land that would allow a new kind of Liverpool is still with us. The um, cultural exchange was clearly something that has had an impact here. People came and went, communities were developed right through from the uh, 18th century onwards. And I actually believe that the mix of people that that brought together is why Liverpool is such a creative place. Uh, things like current terminology like creative hubs and that kind of thing. But there is plenty of creativity in Liverpool. Look at, look at the music that's already been mentioned. Um, uh, Liverpool took on board all kinds of music from all kinds of places uh, and exported it again as the Beatles. So I could say the same kinds of things about global trade and global migration. But um, what I would rather do is just take you through what I think um, the, where the value lies. So just in sort of finishing up really, I think there is value clearly in the tangible physical assets. Um, not only here in Liverpool, but as part of the collection. There is value in encouraging through the World Heritage Site inward investment. We've seen it happen. Um, Harcourt are here tonight. They did a fantastic job on the, on the hotel. The opportunity to capitalise on those intangible attributes, which are very strong here in Liverpool, is still potential but not realised. The common framework for assisting the city planners, Liverpool City Council, in resolving these development and conservation issues. It's a common cause, and these days I don't think anybody would say World Heritage Site values are, are worthless. It generates civic pride and identity. There is value in that. And perhaps most importantly these days, when tourism has become so uh, uh, prevalent and so important in terms of economy in these times of public money being reduced, World Heritage Sites are a world-class brand, and that is hugely important. Again, smothered a little here by other things, but still there for the taking. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up. Jerry is making rude signs at me down there. Um, so um, that quote is taken out of the management plan, uh, current management plan. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that distinctive and intangible values underpin the historic fabric here and in the World Heritage Site. And they fully represent the people of Liverpool 
And that's the key point. Secondly, I would say the World Heritage Site is, uh, status is well worth keeping. Uh, and what we need to do is harness those values in a modern sense. Let that asset work for the city, to the city itself and its people. Thank you so much.